My name is PJ Lamberson and I'm a professor of communication at the University of California, Los Angeles. And today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some research that's related to a lot of work that I do. One of the big things that I study is how things spread from person to person. So this could be rumors or information or products or behaviors. Before I came to UCLA, I spent a lot of time teaching MBA students. I was a professor of uh, at a business school at MIT and then at the Kellogg School of Management and I taught a lot of executives, a lot of business students and one of the things that these people always want to know when they come to a class about social networks is how do I find the influencers? That is those people that are like somehow going to tap into their communities of interest and that if we could just reach those people then they would be able to spread the word about our new product or our new service or get everybody else on board with what we're wanting to do. And so what I'm going to talk to you specifically about today is what we've learned from computational social science about influencers or influentials. So if you look in popular press today, this idea of influencers is everywhere. And uh, one great example of this is Kim Kardashian. So Kim Kardashian supposedly, and I guess there's good evidence for this, gets paid upwards of $10,000 per tweet to tweet about a, an individual's product. And she's not the only one that's tweeting about these products. Uh, if you go to, there's a company called Sponsored Tweets. They, don't, they no longer have this price list uh, that you see here up anymore, but you can look and see popular celebrities like Snooki from uh, Jersey Shore and Kendra Wilkinson, and, and they're getting paid thousands of dollars to tweet on behalf of these companies. So at least somebody thinks that these people really have some kind of substantial influence that they're worth being paid all this money. And if we look about where this idea came from, uh, there's, there's a lot of sort of popular support for this. So Malcolm Gladwell wrote this book, The Tipping Point, and in The Tipping Point, he has something that he calls the law of the few. And the law of the few basically says that Whenever something spreads, somewhere along the way, one of what he calls an exceptional person found about, about that trend and using their enthusiasm and their energy and their charisma, those exceptional people create the cascade that gets everybody else on board with the trend. If you go and look for lessons about word of mouth marketing or viral marketing, you'll see tons of these top five lessons for marketers and uh, guaranteed every time you'll see somewhere on there something about influencers. They say that you need to engage the influencers, get the influencers involved. And this is also a big part of academic research. There are articles written like some of the ones you see here where people are talking about how do you find these influencers and identify them so that you can get them on, on board trying to promote your product or business or service. Uh, and this hasn't been just a recent phenomenon. This existed back before even social media was a big thing, before Facebook, before Twitter. There was a really popular book, a uh, business book written called The Influentials, in which they say, you know, one American in ten tells the other nine Americans what to eat, what to wear, how to vote, and, and all these things. And going back even further, there was a theory in communication called the two-step flow model. And the way the two-step flow model worked it said that basically uh, information was spread to the public from the mass media and that information would reach to a set of elites, a set of influencers. And those people sort of served as gatekeepers or tastemakers for everybody else. And they then that information flowed from the media to them and from them to the public. And that's how the public decided these things like what to eat, what to wear, who to vote for, etc. Right? But with the advent of social media, what companies have felt they could do is that they could bypass the media and go directly to these influencers, right? And for them, this is, this is a very tantalizing opportunity because uh, in the two-step flow model, the media controls the access to these influencers and therefore they can extract a lot of money from companies who want to pay to reach those people, right? And this is why time on a Super Bowl ad costs so much because you reach so many people and the only way to do it was through mass media. But now companies felt they could reach these influencers directly and then through them influence all the people that they wanted to be on board with them. So what I wanna do is talk about 
two different sort of types of computational social science where people have tried to look at and understand does this idea of, of influencers really hold up when we subject it to sort of scientific testing. And so partially we're going to look at some empirical computational social science. And what that means is we're going to actually look at real data from Twitter and see whether or not there's evidence that there are these influential people and that we can find them and, and that they're actually worth paying $10,000. And then we're going to look at some um, simulations, some co computer models, in which we try to simulate a model of influence and try to understand how much more influential people who have a lot of connections are relative to people who have few connections. So if you go and just take a, a casual look at things that have sort of spread or gone viral, there's kind of a mixed message. So what I'm showing you right now here, uh, one of the times that I went to teach some of these executives, I flew down to Miami. Uh, we had a campus in Miami where I was teaching in Coral Gables, which is an area of Miami, and there was a huge rainstorm there. The streets were flooded, and uh, it, it was a big deal. This happened to be when LeBron James was playing for the Miami Heat, and he posted this on his Instagram account, right? And you can see him saying here, you know, rain, rain, go away, Mother Nature's nothing to mess with. So, in addition to being a, a great basketball player, LeBron James is also quite the wordsmith. But uh, what I want to take away from this is not just that LeBron James posted this thing about how much rain there was, but as a result of this, this is an actual official National Weather Service alert that came out. And as you can see, they're referencing LeBron James's Instagram post as evidence for the fact that there was widespread flooding in the Coral Gables area. Now, I didn't happen to post pictures on my Instagram account, even though I was there in Coral Gables as well. But I'm pretty sure if I had posted pictures of this flooding, it wouldn't have gotten turned into a National Weather Service alert. And so what I want to point out by this example is that it looks like people like LeBron James seem to have an outsized influence relative to sort of normal human beings like, like you and I. I also went through and looked up, this is a few, few years back, the five top five most retweeted tweets of all time, right? So the number one tweet was tweeted by Justin Bieber, right? Clearly somebody who you think of as being an influencer, someone who is a celebrity and has lots of name recognition. The number two tweet was tweeted by um, a linebacker for the Green Bay Packers, right? This was, to get some context, there was a time in the NFL where the regular refs were on strike and they were paying these replacement refs. And TJ Lang from the Green Bay Packers says, find me and take my salary to pay the regular refs uh, because he was so sick of having these, uh, these stand-in refs that were not doing as well. Number three is Floyd Mayweather calling out Manny Pacquiao for a boxing match. Number four is Kim Kardashian tweeting about um, a young woman who had cancer. And number five was Barack Obama tweeting his support for same-sex marriage. So if you look at these top five most tweeted tweets of all time, all of them are posted by people that you might think of as real influencers, right? People who have celebrity name recognition. On the other hand, there are lots of things that have gone viral that were posted by relatively regular people. So for example, during the Boston Marathon, uh, shortly after the Boston Marathon bombing, when they were searching for the, the, sus the suspected bombers, uh, the city of Boston and some surrounding areas went on what they called lockdowns. Everybody had to stay inside. They couldn't go outside um, because they were searching the streets for these suspects. And during that time, the Brookline Police Department posted this picture of a police officer delivering milk to a family with young children. And this photo was shared more than 100,000 times. Now the Brookline Police Department, you know, is not an influencer in the traditional sense of the word. This isn't uh, somebody that has tons and tons of Twitter followers or lots of people who are interested in them. Um, and yet, nonetheless, they posted this picture and it really spread quite widely. Another example is this tweet that was posted during a presidential debate between Barack Obama and Mitt Romney. This was posted by a Boston University student. His name is Patrick Curran. You can see here that he only had a few hundred followers. He was just a regular college student, just like probably many of you are. Um, he was in no way a celebrity or had any kind of name recognition, but his tweet was retweeted thousands of times, tens of thousands of times. 
he was actually mentioned on uh, news shows, regular, uh, like on the Today Show and so forth. People were talking about this tweet. Um, and so here's just, a, again, a regular person posting something that somehow manages to, to go viral. And then one of my favorite examples of all time, probably almost all of you have seen this video, it's called Charlie Bit My Finger. And this is of two young boys in, in the UK. Um, if you haven't seen it, you can, you can go look it up on YouTube. This was posted back in 2007. And when it was posted, um, this was just a video that a father had taken of his two young boys. He wanted to share it with their grandfather. Uh, who lived back in the United States, and the file was too big for him to email back to the grandfather. And so the only way he could figure out to share it was to post it on YouTube. He didn't really have any um, intention for anybody to see this except for the grand grandfather of the kids. But by coincidence, you know, he posted it here on this public forum, and this actually became for quite some time the most viewed YouTube video of all time, right? The family went on to produce many more videos of these kids. They actually created a Charlie Bit My Finger app, and they've estimated that they've made over half a million dollars as a result of monetizing and running ads from essentially what was an accident. So when we look at these contrasting examples, you see on the one hand that many of the things that have gone viral were posted by traditionally what we would think of as influencers, which might give weight to this argument that there are certain people who really have an outsized influence. But on the other hand, there are lots of things that have gone viral that seem to have just been posted by like regular people like you and me. And so this sort of begs, uh, raises this question of, uh, you know, maybe it, anybody can be uh, influential and it's really just all up to chance. So let's see what the science has to say about this. So the first study that I'm gonna to talk to you about was a study that was done using Twitter. And almost everybody probably knows about Twitter, but just to give you a quick background in case you're not familiar with it, if you have a Twitter account, you can post very short messages. They're limited to 140 characters or more. Uh, if you have a Twitter account, you can choose other people to follow. And when you post these tweets, you get to see all the tweets are by other people that you have followed, right? One of the things that people post on Twitter a lot are links. So they will post a link to a news article or a blog article. Uh, to share with their followers if they find it interesting. One of the cool things about the fact that people have to limit their message to 140 characters is that when anybody posts a link to, uh, say, a New York Times article or Washington Post article, they have to shorten the URL, that is, that address, the www.newyorktimes, etc. Because if they were to post the entire link, it would take up all or maybe even more than the 140 characters they have allocated to them because those links are so long. And so in order to post the link, they shorten it using a service like Bitly. Um, and what those services do is they take that long link and they replace it with a very small short link that points to the original article. What's so great about that for us as researchers is that when someone shortens a link, if you shorten the link and I shorten the link, it gets two different shortened versions. So if you post a link to an article and I post a link to the same article, even though we're pointing to the same article, they're going to be two different URLs that we post, your shortened, shortened version and my shortened version. And what that means is now if we see somebody else repost a link to that same article, we can tell whether or not they were reposting your link or my link or reposting it themselves independently by shortening it on their own. So that allows us to track how these links propagate through the Twitter network and track these chains of influence as one person posts it, another person reposts it, and so on and so on and so forth. So in this study, they tracked over 74 million of these Twitter URLs that were posted and reposted by over 1.6 million Twitter users during a two-month period back in 2009. And so this is a picture of a few of the cascades that they found. Across the top up there, you see just some dots that are all by themselves. That's an example of a tweet where somebody posted a link and then nobody ever reposted it at all. Then here you see <clears throat> some place where a person posted a link and then many of their followers reposted that same link. And then there's lots of other more complicated patterns where of postings and repostings, some people posting links to the same article twice in two different versions, and that's why you see these loops come and close back like this. 
So they tracked all these cascades to try to understand, essentially, are there certain people that when they post a link, it gets reposted a lot, versus other people that when they post a link, it just doesn't go anywhere. Okay. So one of the first things that they found when they looked at all of these postings and repostings is the following pattern. So this is a picture of a distribution, and it's pictured in a kind of unusual way that you might not be used to. So if you look at the axes here, they don't just go one, two, three, four, five, but they're on what we call log scales, okay? So along the bottom here, you see 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, right? Those are the number of times that a particular uh, tweet had been reposted. And then on the vertical axis, you see the fraction of tweets that were reposted that many times in the data. So this graph looks kind of roughly like a straight line. What that means, if we were to transform this to a regular scale, it would look something like this. So a curve like this. And what that says is that a huge fraction of the tweets were reposted very, very few times, right? In fact, 98% of the links that were posted were never reposted at all. But then there's a very tiny fraction of the, of the links that when they were reposted, they were reposted hundreds or tens of thousands of times, right? So most things go nowhere, but a few things really explode, right? So that's the first thing that they found in our data. And so what might be interesting to know is, are those things that explode, that really go viral, were they posted by a particularly special subset of individuals, okay? So our strategy for trying to figure this out works like this. And this is a common strategy in sort of empirical social science. We're going to take our data set of all these 74 million tweets, and we're going to split it in two. We're going to think of half of this data as though it was the past, right? We're going to imagine that this is the data that we already have available to us. And we're going to take that data and plug it into a statistical model, right? So we're going to run like a fancy kind of regression on this where we have all kinds of variables available to us. Like we're going to know um, how many followers a person has, how many people they're following, how long they've had a Twitter account, and most importantly, whether or not they have created other cascades before. We're going to use that information to try to predict how influential a person is going to be in the future. And we're going to compare that predicted level of influence to the other half of our data that we've kept over here on the side, we're going to treat that as the future. Right? And so what we're going to see is if, based on this half of our data, can we predict the other half of our data? If we can correctly predict this future half of our data, that is, if we could identify the influencers based on half our data and predict them accurately for the other half, what that means is that there really are people who are, who are actually influential. And we could, in theory now, take the information that we have uh, to, up to today and predict who's going to be influential in the real future that we don't actually have access to. So you probably have heard about this in some of the other lectures in this course where they've talked about a training set and a test set. And so that's essentially what we're doing here. The data that we're treating as the past is our training set. We're going to train our model on that data. We're going to fit it to that data. And then we're going to test the accuracy of our model on this test set, but we're thinking of the future data set, okay? Now, on the other hand, if when we run our model on this past data, on this training data, it does not match our test data, our future data, then what that means is that we, given all of this information, we really can't predict whether or not somebody's going to be influential in the future. And that's really important because if you're, say, a company who's trying to decide, should I pay somebody $10,000 or not, you don't need to know whether they were influential in the past. What you need to know is, are they going to be influential in the future when they post this tweet that you've just paid them $10,000 to tweet, right? If you can't actually predict who's going to be influential, then how do you know who to pay? Okay, so when they did all this, first, just looking at the past data, they found that of all those variables, only two variables were statistically significant in terms of predicting whether or not someone was going to be influential. And those two variables were how many followers a person had on Twitter and whether or not they've been influential in the past. Both of those variables were statistically significant, meaning that we know for sure that those have some positive effect 
on the probability that a person's tweet will be reposted, right? But the fit of the model was pretty poor. We're not actually able to explain very much of the variability and whether or not a tweet spreads or doesn't spread based on these two factors. In other words, a lot of what determines whether or not a tweet is going to spread or not must have to do with something else besides all those variables that we were looking at. Right? Another way to look at this is, you'll see I have a, a box here which I'm about to fill in. There's two axes on this graph. On the horizontal axis, what you can see is how influential a person has been in the past. And on the vertical axis, you see how many followers they have. So these are those two variables that are statistically significant in terms of predicting whether or not someone's going to be influential in the future. And what I'm about to, to reveal for you on this graph in a second is I'm going to put up here 25 points, which are the 25 most retweeted URLs in the future data set, in our testing data set, right? Now, if we were able to accurately predict who was going to be influential, we would expect these 25 most retweeted URLs to all appear in the upper right-hand corner of this graph, right? Because that's where the people are who have lots of followers and who have been very influential in the past, okay? But when we look at the actual data, what you see is that they're spread all over the place, right? Some of them were tweeted by people that we would expect to be influential, who have lots of followers and have had lots of past influence, but some of them were tweeted by accounts that are essentially no names at this point, right? This is like accounts like Patrick Curran or the Brooklyn Police Department or the father who posted the Charlie Bit My Finger video. They're just regular old people and yet somehow their tweets went viral, right? So there's all, it's all over the map. And so <clears throat> kind of to summarize this up, the authors of this paper have this nice quote. They say, although large cascades tend to be driven by previously successful individuals with many followers, right? The extreme scarcity, the fact that so few tweets even go viral in the first place means that even those people who are somewhat slightly more influential, most of the time they're not successful either, right? This is a little bit complicated to get your head around, and so to, to make this a little more concrete, I'm going to give you another example of how this works. Right? So imagine for a second that you're feeling a little sick. Right? This may have happened to you or may have happened to somebody you know. You, you wake up in the night, you've got a scratchy throat, you know, you're feeling groggy or something, so what do you do? You go to Google, right? and you start looking up your symptoms. And maybe you're like this, or maybe you're, your roommate is like this, but they find uh, a very scary and, um, you know, deadly disease, and they are convinced that they definitely have this thing and they're going to die tomorrow, right, based on their symptoms, okay? And you say, well, you look at this, but, uh, you know, I, I don't think you're probably going to die. You probably don't have this. This is, this is, is not a very common disease. So, for example, uh, I pulled this off of the internet. This is a disease called achalasia, right? And it sounds, uh, it, it's a very bad disease. It's potentially, potentially deadly. Um, but if you look at these symptoms, right, these are symptoms that almost anybody could have, right? Minor weight loss, uh, a little bit of a cough, and so forth, okay? So if you had these symptoms and you went and looked this up, you might be very scared that you've got the symptoms of this terrible disease, right? But it turns out that fewer than one in six million people actually have this disease. And so just because you have these symptoms, it doesn't mean that you're very likely to have these diseases this disease, even though if you have this disease, you're very likely to have these symptoms. And this is a problem that we call the base rate fallacy in statistics, which is to confuse two different conditional probabilities. The probability that you have the disease given that you have the symptoms is not equal to the probability that you have the symptoms given that you have the disease. The second probability, the prob probability that you have the symptoms if you have the disease, is very high. If you have achalasia, you're almost for certain to have those symptoms. But just because you have those symptoms doesn't make you very likely to have the disease. Some of you have taken a statistics course. You might remember with dread a formula called Bayes' rule, right? Bayes' rule is actually what determines how these probabilities are related to one another. And what really determines how sort of close these two things are to each other is what we call the base rate, right? That's these two probabilities, the probability of A and probability of B in this equation, 
Or in other words, it's really the probability that a person has this disease overall in the population and the probability that a person has these symptoms overall in the population. If the probability that a person has this disease is extremely low, and the probability that a person has these symptoms is relatively high, then these two conditional probabilities will be very different from one another, right? And so what that means is you're probably panicking for no reason if you think you have this disease. Now, how does this apply to our influencers and tweets going viral? Well, it's a very similar situation where now the probability that something goes viral, given that it was treated by an influencer, is not equal to the probability it was tweeted by an influencer, given that it went viral, right? The probability that something was tweeted by an influencer, given that you already know that it went viral, is relatively high, right? If we looked at those top five most retweeted tweets of all time, they were all tweeted basically by people we would have identified as influencers. But the probability that something goes viral if it is tweeted by a so-called influencer is actually relatively low because the base rate is so low. It's extremely unlikely for anything to really be retweeted that much. Remember, 98% of the URLs weren't retweeted at all. So now I'm going to look at this from a different angle, still using computational social science, but there are really multiple ways that computational social science works. So, so far we've seen using computational social science to look at some empirical data. Now I'm going to use some computer simulation modeling to try to test this hypothesis in a sort of hypothetical world. Right? And we're going to do this using social networks. So right here you have a picture of my Facebook network. Every one of these dots is somebody that I'm friends with on Facebook, and they're connected if those two people are Facebook friends of each other. When we think about things spreading from person to person, we think of them spreading through these links, going from, from one dot to another through the lines in this picture, essentially, right? Or here's an example of a very small piece of the Twitter network, right? So each one of these little words is the name of a Twitter account, and they're connected if one Twitter account follows another. So what we're gonna do in this study is take a hypothetical social network like this. We're gonna take a bunch of dots connected by lines, and we're going to start something spreading at some of the individuals in that network, okay? We're gonna assume that whenever anybody is sort of infected with a message, we can think of this as like a disease, whenever anybody has a message and they share it with their friends, there's just some fixed probability that a given person that they're connected to is going to become infected with that disease as well and start spreading it to their friends, right? So you can think of this as like a viral video. I'm infected with a video if I've seen it and I'm telling all my friends about it and all my friends that I tell about it have some probability of going and watching it and then starting to tell their friends about it, which means that they're infected with the disease too, right? Or infected with the video. So what we're going to do is simulate that happening on different social networks. We're gonna create different social networks. We're gonna start something spreading through that process. And we're gonna start it at different people. We'll start it spreading at people who have few connections and then start it spreading at people who have lots of connections and see if it spreads farther or faster or is more likely to spread when we start it at the people who have lots of connections versus the people who have few connections. At the same time, we're also gonna be changing the global structure of that social network. So we're gonna go from social networks that have overall very few connections to social networks that have overall a high number of connections. So we're gonna vary the average number of connections or what we call the average degree of those social networks. Okay. So here are the results. So what you can see in this graph, along the horizontal here axis here, this is where we're changing the social network. This is the average degree or the average number of connections that a person has in a social network. And it goes from a social network where people have very few connections to a social network where on average people have a lot of connections. Then we've got two different lines here. One is the average number of people who become, so quote, become infected with this message when it was started by a regular person or by a person who has a lot of connections, right, and influential, so to speak. And the vertical axis is how many people ultimately become infected by, by this contagion when we started at these two different types of people. 
And so the thing to notice here is that these two curves, the curve that represents what happens when we start it at an influential person versus what happens when we start it at a regular person, those two curves are almost the same, right? There's very little difference in how many people ultimately become infected between whether you started at an influential person or a regular person. What does seem to have a big impact on how far something spreads is the overall structure of the network. When the overall network has very few connections, nothing spreads no matter who starts it. When the overall network has a lot of connections, things spread very far, again, no matter who starts it, right? And so what's really determining whether or not something spreads or not is the sort of density of the network. So one way you can think about that density of the network is really that's the, that's the probability that a person that I talk to is going to respond to my message. The more people that I talk to that respond to my message, it's making my network sort of essentially the overall network more dense. So messages that are more enticing, videos that are more funny, things that resonate with people more, products that appeal to people's needs more, or products that are more visible so that when we use them, other people see them more easily. Those are the kinds of things that have sort of more connections and are more likely to spread. It really has more to do with the thing that's spreading and the overall network that it's spreading through than the individual person who starts it. And the authors, again, of this study sum this up in a nice way. They say, the ability of any individual to trigger a cascade depends much more on the global structure of the influence network than it does on his or her personal degree of influence. That is, if the overall network permits global cascades, virtually anyone can start one. But if it doesn't permit global cascades, nobody can. And so putting this all together, we're really questioning whether or not paying someone like Kim Kardashian is actually worth the $10,000 that she's being paid. There's one caveat to this. So everything that we've been talking about so far today is about something spreading from person to person to person to person, right? And what we've seen is that really there are not people who have outsized influence, or at least that we can predict people who have consistent outsized influence when it comes to getting things to spread from person to person. And so what that means for something like a company is that they have to go back to this old model where they have to just reach lots of people. They can't depend on a few influential people. So the one thing that somebody like Kim Kardashian has going is that she has many, many followers. And so in a sense, Kim Kardashian is playing the role of the mass media that we had in the old days. She's really not an influencer in the sense of creating long cascades, but she can reach a lot of people because she, in one step because she has so many followers. And so paying Kim Kardashian to tweet for you is a little bit like paying for an ad to be run on regular television. It's probably not going to ca cascade where person after person after person retweets her message, but it is going to reach a lot of different uh, individuals. And so hopefully for those companies, at least somebody is going to do whatever it is that they're trying to get them to do. If you're more interested in learning about diffusion and networks, this is a big area of my research. I wrote a review paper about this called Diffusion and Networks for the Oxford Handbook, or you can go to my website, socialdynamics.org where I have links to other articles and blog posts about these topics. Thanks so much.